History has certain ways to be remembered. Most often, it's because it never lets us forget. In light of recent events, the sinking of the RMS Titanic has come back into the public eye due to the disaster of the Titan submersible. Another tragic event at the original site of the Titanic's demise in which we hearken back to those fateful days in April of 1912. We remember the tragedy and the striking of fate. We remember the bitter cold water, chaos, and disorganization. Above all, we remember the loss of human life and the tragedy that befell not only those present, but the event as a whole that continues to encapsulate the human imagination to this day. To cover this story, I'm going to be doing it in two parts. This week, I'll tell you about the dream of the White Star Line and Bruce Ismay. I'll tell you of the unsinkable plans drafted by Thomas Andrews, the majesty of the ship that once was, and what exactly went wrong that fateful night. Was anyone specific to blame for this incident? Was it the unpreparedness of the crew to deal with the situation, or the unwillingness of the passengers to do as they were told? Whatever questions you might have, they'll be answered this week, so keep listening. I'm your host, Nick, and you're listening to an exciting new two-part chapter of the Insidious Agenda podcast. This is part one of chapter 43, covering the sinking of the RMS Titanic. The pre-war period in Europe focused heavily on industrialization. As part of that, the need for shipbuilding arose. But we're not talking about your transport vessels. These ships were akin to gods, among others of their time. At the forefront of this competition were the nations of the United Kingdom and Germany. Forming the story were four competing shipbuilders. Out of Germany were the Norddeutsche Lloyd and Hamburg America lines. Out of the United Kingdom were Canard and the White Star Line. The key focus was on building ocean liners that were expedient and larger than life. First out of the gate was the Nord Deutscher's blue ribboned, award winning ship, the Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse, launching in 1897. This was the first ship of their Kaiser line, sharing the distinction with Crown Prince Wilhelm, Kaiser Wilhelm II, and Crown Princessin Cecilia. Years later, it was supplanted by Haypeg's Deutschland in 1900. The first foray into this competition from the United Kingdom was from the Cunard Line, when they constructed their two famous Greyhounds of the Sea, the Lusitania and the Mauritania. They were given the nickname Greyhounds due to their unimaginable top speed. The latter of these ships held the Blue Ribbon Award for 20 years, the entire period between 1909 and 1929. To keep pace, White Star Line released their Big Four Line, four ships weighing 20,000 tons each, consisting of the Celtic, the Cedric, the Baltic, and the Adriatic. The White Star Line's Big Four were built with both size and luxury in mind. They knew deep down they would never be able to keep pace with Canard's Greyhounds. So, in 1907, the president of White Star Line, Joseph Bruce Ismay, and Harland and Wolfe shipyard director, Lord William J. Peary, decided to take the race a little further. They dreamt into existence the creation of three vessels. Vessels which were given the name the Olympic Class, furthering a bond between the two companies that had existed since 1867. White Star Line knew that they couldn't compete with Canard's speed, so they abandoned that in favor of both size and luxury. Their intent was 
was for the line to be the most luxurious ships in the North Atlantic. There was also a second reason for the creation of these ships, which was to increase the company's presence in the Southampton, Cherbourg, and New York shipping lanes, thus having the ability to run a weekly route between the three. In the contract, the first two ships were to be constructed to a sum not exceeding three million pounds, or 310 million today. The three ships, the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Britannic, were designed by naval architect Thomas Andrews. Assisting him were his second, Edward Wilding, and Alexander Carlyle, the chief draftsman and general manager. On the 29th of July in 1908, the shipyard presented drawings to Bruce Ismay and the board of White Star Line. These designs were approved with letters of agreement signed in only two days. The ships were laid down in Belfast, Ireland, with the Olympic, or its working number, number 400, in 1908, and the Titanic, number 401, in 1909. The Britannic was slightly delayed, not being laid down until 1911, due to both the commissioning of the Olympic and the launch of the Titanic. The ships were constructed on Queen's Island, in Belfast Harbour, an area now given the name the Titanic Quarter. When the Heartland and Wolf shipyard set out to build these vessels, nothing like this had ever been done before. Well, at least nothing of this magnitude, to be fair. Titanic was constructed parallel to her sister, Olympic, and took around 26 months total to complete. Before she was complete, Titanic had already claimed many limbs and lives. In total, 246 injuries were reported, with 28 being severe in the construction. Of these severe injuries, many were largely crush injuries to limbs due to large machines or falling plates of steel. Six builders even lost their lives during the construction phase, with another two in the adjacent shipyards and sheds. One worker was even killed by a falling wooden beam shortly before the Titanic was launched. Each of the Olympic-class ships was built on nine decks, seven of which passengers had access to. It's important to get a look at each to understand not only the luxury dreamt up by Ismay and Peary, but also for later on, so we can see how far some passengers had to evacuate, or even if it was possible. The uppermost deck was known as the boat deck, and used to house the lifeboats and funnels. It also contained the bridge and the wheelhouse at the forward end, in addition to the captain's and officer's quarters. Moving backward, around midships, was where the entrance to the first-class grand staircase and gymnasium were held. My question to you here is how many of you just pictured the staircase from the James Cameron movie? Because I did. Moving aft, you found the first-class smoke room, the deck house for the engineers, and an entrance for second-class passengers. The boat deck was segregated into four separate areas, so the officers, staff, first, and second-class passengers did not have to intermingle with one another. It wouldn't have been a detriment to anyone, but that's the world we lived in at the time. All views off the boat deck were obstructed by lifeboats, with the exception of the views for the first-class passengers. Now, this seems a bit lofty when you think, oh, here they are segregating the passengers. But when you consider the price that each paid for their ticket, yeah, I'd certainly want a view if I was in first class. To put it in perspective for you, the second class tickets and third class tickets ranged between $15 US and $60 US. If you were in first class and wanted a simple room, it was around $150 or 1700 today. If you wanted one of the two parlor staterooms, like you saw Kate and Cal have in Titanic, that would run you $4,350, or by modern standards, 50000 Keep in mind as well, this was a one-week trip. So yeah, after we outline that to you, you'd want a view as well. Also on the boat deck, in the so-called silent room, 
were telegraph operators Jack Phillips and Harold Bride. Both were employees of the Marconi International Marine Communication Company. The pair were responsible for receiving and transmitting messages via Morse code under the ship's call sign Mike Golf Yankee, MGY. Their equipment was state-of-the-art, a 5-kilowatt rotary spark gap transmitter. A lesser-known fact is that Titanic was one of the first ships to use this equipment and, when transmitting, gave off a slight musical tone so that it could be easily distinguished in its transmissions. The broadcast of the ship could reach a distance of 700 miles in diameter. A deck, known as the promenade deck, and B deck, the bridge deck, were both home to first class and second class passengers. This is where the staterooms and first class passenger berths were held. They were accompanied by a lounge, smoke room, reading and writing room, and palm court. The restaurants, which were a la carte, were positioned aft on B deck and housed the famous Café Parisienne. C deck, the shelter deck, ran right around the ship from bow to stern unobstructed. This was the third class promenade area. It also housed the cargo cranes, crew cabins, public rooms, and sat below the second class library. D deck, the saloon deck, was comprised of public spaces. Forward on the ship was the quarters for the firemen, and it was also the top level of the ship's watertight bulkheads. E-deck, the upper deck, included accommodations for all three classes of passengers, in addition to cooks, deckhands, stewards, and trimmers. The long passage which housed the third-class cabins was affectionately named Scotland Road, after a street in Liverpool. F-deck, the middle deck was the last built completely, housing more passengers and crew. This is also the area where the third-class dining saloon was located, in addition to the Turkish baths, which were only accessible for first-class passengers. G deck, the lower deck, was the lowest level for passengers, with portholes sitting just above the waterline. It also included the post office, in which five postal clerks worked 13 hours a day, seven days a week, sorting over 60,000 pieces of mail per day. It also included provision storage. Beneath G-Deck was an area only known as the Orlop Decks. This was mainly cargo spaces and boilers, engines, turbines, and electrical generators. There were sets of stairs down from the Orlop Decks that emanated here and ran all the way up to D-Deck. Each ship was driven by propellers, the outer propellers had three blades each, while the innermost and center propeller had four. All were driven by steam turbine. Well, that's the simplest way I can put it, without getting into too technical of details. Power was generated by 29 coal fire steam boilers across six different compartments. Each ship was 269 meters long and weighed around 45,000 tons. Olympic, which came out first, was the largest ship in the world at the time, until it was dwarfed by Titanic. Each ship had four iconic funnels, for which the fourth was just for show and didn't actually work. It served more for ventilation, and cut down on ventilation tubes within the ship that were more commonly noted on the canard lines Lusitania and Mauritania. When each ship was constructed, it was outfitted with 20 lifeboats. When it's mentioned in James Cameron's film, Titanic, that 20 was less than half of what should have been there, that was correct. However, there are reasons why that I'll get into a little bit later, outside of obstructing the view of passengers. Both the Titanic and Olympic were built to carry 64, but the decision was made not to take the full complement. This is even more put into perspective when some considered that the Titanic was unsinkable and made it the greatest lifeboat possible. Now, before we get a little bit too crazy thinking what idiot made that decision, that even with 20 lifeboats, the Olympic-class ships were still well surpassing modern standard. At this point, we'll depart from the Olympic line in general and turn our focus 
to Titanic. Just after noon, at 12.15 p.m. on Wednesday the 31st of May in 1911, Titanic was launched. The momentous occasion was witnessed by Lord Peary, John Pierpont Morgan, J.P. Morgan, and Bruce Ismay. Three people. Yeah, I know, cool, Nick, right? However, in addition to those, there were another 100,000 spectators. The ship was slipped into the River Lagan, aided by a slipway that was greased with 22 tons of soap. Over the course of the next year, she was kitted out with the remainder of her engines, funnels, and exterior structures. Liverpool was registered as the home port, due to the offices of both White Star Line and Canard being located there. In 1907, they moved some of their offices to Southampton for its express service, due in large part due to proximity of London. Because of some of the latter stages of construction, which aided in the ship gaining the ability to call herself the heaviest ship on the seas, she was delayed in completing her build. Had the last sets of changes not gone ahead, Titanic might have avoided its destiny altogether. In the days preceding her maiden voyage, Titanic slipped to sea for trials, beginning at 6 a.m. on the 2nd of April in 1912. She took with her a crew of 78 stokers, greasers, and firemen, as well as 41 others, cooks, officers, etc., the sea trials were attended by Thomas Andrews and his deputy Edward Wilding, in addition to many others. Due to an illness, Bruce Ismay could not attend. One of the key trial results that plays a part later in this story is what's known as the crash-stop trial. This required bringing the engines to full astern from their full ahead position, and it was able to stop the ship in 3 minutes and 15 seconds, at a distance of just over 750 meters. After about 13 hours, Titanic returned to Belfast, coming to her berth around 7 p.m. and being declared seaworthy. Only an hour later, it slipped again and departed on a journey of 570 nautical miles, about 1,060 kilometers, to the British port of Southampton. She arrived 28 hours later, at midnight on the 4th, and was given birth number 44. Here, Titanic awaited the passengers and remainder of her crew. Many of Titanic's crew were not tied to the ship, and only came aboard as casual staff, the majority of whom boarded the ship shortly before her disembarkation. I'll give you a slight overview of the ship's officers, not in depth as some will be included next week, akin to some of the passengers, but it's important to know and recognize some of the key names involved in the events to come. Charged with the Titanic was the senior captain of the White Star Line Company, Captain Edward John Smith, a captain who actually left his post as the first captain of the Olympic to take the position of the Titanic's captainship. I would imagine that, in the future, if having given been the choice, Smith would have also taken on the Britannic as well. Serving under Captain Smith was Chief Officer Henry Tingle Wild, who followed his captain from the Olympic. The remainder of the officer corps were First Officer Lieutenant William Murdoch, Second Officer Sub-Lieutenant Charles Lightoller, Third Officer Sub-Lieutenant Herbert Pittman, Fourth Officer Sub-Lieutenant Joseph Boxall, Fifth Officer Sub-Lieutenant Harold Lowe, and Sixth Officer Sub-Lieutenant James Paul Moody. In addition to these men, at key positions were one bosun, two medical doctors, 29 able seamen, two bosun's mates, two masters at arms, seven quartermasters, two window cleaners, and six lookouts. Outside of the seven officers, Titanic had a further 878 crew members. For passengers... Titanic embarked around 1,317 passengers, 324 first class, 284 second, and 709 third. The sex disparity was 66% male, or 869, to 34% female, 447. 
there also numbered 107 children, the bulk of which were in the third class. Had Titanic sailed at its full complement, she could have had 2,453 passengers, but sailed at less than 50% capacity. That's something to ponder as we near the penultimate moment of today's story. Some notable members aboard were John Jacob Astor IV and his wife Madeline, Benjamin Guggenheim, Francis Millet, Isidore and Ida Strauss, Colonel Archibald Gracie, Elsie Bowerman, William Thomas Stead, and for fans of the Cameron film that already know, the insinkable Molly Brown. Bruce Ismay and Thomas Andrews were both actually aboard as well. There was also a member of the crew who boarded the day of her departure and signed in the crew log with the name J. Dawson. Whether that's actually the Jack Dawson or someone the movie character was based on, I'll tell you about next week. And yes, there were a myriad of other notable passengers that I didn't include in this list. One omission from the roster was also J.P. Morgan, who was supposed to travel on Titanic but had to cancel at the last minute. Lucky for him. Titanic began embarking her passengers in Southampton at 9.30 a.m. on the 10th of April and was able to slip on time at noon sharp. It was almost as though her maiden voyage wasn't meant to be, as it narrowly avoided a collision with two smaller steamships on the way out of the channels. Eventually, she made her way out of the port and into the open English Channel, bound for the French port at Cherbourg. This was only a small jaunt of about 143 kilometers and only took four hours. Those embarking at Cherbourg needed small boats, known as tenders, as there was no berth big enough to support the enormity of Titanic. Cherbourg offered up another 270 poor passengers to those who boarded in Southampton, while 24 disembarked. The whole process took 90 minutes, and she left Cherbourg at 8 p.m., bound for Queenstown. Titanic arrived in Cork Harbor, off Ireland's south coast, shortly before noon on the 11th of April, and embarked a further 123 passengers, disembarking seven, officially. One crew member, John Coffey, a stoker, jumped ship by hiding underneath a pile of mailbags. One of the notable disembarkations here was a young Jesuit trainee named Francis Brown, who is credited with so many photos aboard Titanic, and holds claim to having one of the last photos of the ship. Credit for the final photo goes to Kate O'Dell, which is the episode art for this week. Finally she was ready to undertake the main journey of her maiden voyage, setting off to arrive at Pier 59 in New York Harbor. Titanic was scheduled to arrive on the morning of April 17th. She crawled along Ireland's coast, following Fastnet Rock, and then out into the open Atlantic. After the first leg of her journey, spanning 1,620 nautical miles, she arrived just south of Newfoundland, in an area known as the Corner. Another 1,000 or so nautical miles later, and she entered the Nantucket Shoals. And it's here where we'll join the ship on the 14th of April. Now you might be thinking, Nick, what happened? You just skipped over three days. Well, the only thing we know is that the first three days went by without an incident. They were literally smooth sailing. Well, as smooth as you can get in the open Atlantic. There were reports that there was also a coal fire in one of the coal bunkers ten days before the voyage, and that it continued burning as the ship set sail, but none of the passengers were the wiser. In the days preceding the incident, Titanic Captain Smith received multiple warnings from other ships in the area to caution Titanic because of ice drifting in the area off the Grand Banks. The easiest way to put this is that the reports were largely ignored, and were mostly considered advisories. Smith placed a heavy reliance on his lookouts, and those officers and crew on watch in the bridge to avoid ice and other types of collisions. Ships did occasionally collide with ice, and none of them in the past had been disastrous, 
recent to that point, a report from 1907 from the SS Kronprinz William said that the ship had rammed a floating iceberg head-on, and though it sustained damage, was able to finish its journey. Smith even commented on that report of the time, saying, I cannot imagine any condition that would cause a ship to flounder. Modern shipbuilding has gone beyond that. On the 14th of April, 1912, Titanic received six such warnings, owing to the fact that the conditions for floating ice were the worst seen in the past 50 years. None of this information found its way past the captain or the radio operators. Most importantly, the lookouts were never advised. Nonetheless, the reports came in beginning around 0900. First, from the RMS Caronia, advising of bergs, growlers, and a field ice. At 42 minutes past one, the Greek ship Athenia relayed a message through the RMS Baltic, who was passing icebergs and large quantities of field ice. Now, Captain Smith did acknowledge both of these reports, and the latter was actually shown to Bruce Ismay. Cameron actually did a great job of depicting this in the film. After the second report, Smith did alter Titanic's course, picking one more southerly that would take them south and minimize the chances of running into an ice field. They were followed up only minutes later at 1.45 by the German ship SS America, who had passed two large icebergs. This message wasn't relayed to either the captain nor the watch officers on the bridge. At 19.30, three large bergs was received from the SS Californian. 21.40 saw much heavy pack ice and great number large icebergs, also field ice, came in from the Masaba. Neither of these two messages left the Titanic radio operator's desks. At this point, some might start pointing the finger at radio operator Jack Phillips, who was on watch at the time. He might never have realized how bad it was getting, or the significance of the warnings as they pertain to naval charting. But... He was spending his time transmitting passengers' messages via the Cape Relay Station in Newfoundland. Nothing is more prevalent here than when he cut off the Californian's second warning at 22.30. The Californian, which had gone to anchor in an ice field due to navigation conditions being treacherous. What was Phillips's reply to the Californian? Cutting them off mid-broadcast, he sent the message. Shut up, shut up. I'm working Cape Race. Thus, Titanic continued on her course, steaming along at 22 knots, which was only too shy of its top speed. In comparison to land speed, 22 knots is the equivalent of 40 kilometers an hour. It might not seem like much, but when you remember that they're steering around a 45,000 pound ship, it kind of puts things in perspective. And you can't exactly put brakes on a propeller. It also might seem a bit excessive for the warnings they received, but maintaining speed, even with the warnings of ice, was standard maritime practice at this time. Remember, the Kronprinz Wilhelm in 1907 went straight into the iceberg. Now to set the scene for what we're about to go through, let's put ourselves in a headspace for the conditions the fateful night of April 14th. It's half past 11 p.m., the ship is near silent, with most of the crew and passengers having turned in for the night. Only three more sleeps, and they'll be in New York City. In the bridge, Second Officer Charles Lightoller has turned over the watch to First Officer William Murdoch. In the crow's nest, on their two-hour watch, are Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee. The crow's nest sits 29 meters above the bridge deck. The air was deathly cold, falling to the point just above the freezing mark. The sea was like glass, Colonel Archibald Gracie later stated, so smooth that the stars were clearly reflected, unbeknownst to most, but calm water at sea, as still as it was, is a telltale sign of a nearby ice field. There was no moonlight on this night, so any ice in the way of Titanic cast no shadow because of the darkness. 
even a higher sea state and rough waves might have made any icebergs immediately noticeable. April 14th was the perfect storm, conditions-wise. One thing most people like to point to that they believe might have mitigated this is that there were no binoculars in the crow's nest. This was true. There was a bit of confusion in Southampton that led to the crow's nest having no set of binoculars. However, with there being no moonlight and no rough water, binoculars wouldn't have been any more effective than the lookout's eyes. It was too black to recognize floating ice. Before going off watch, Charles Lightoller told his lookouts to keep a sharp lookout for ice, particularly small ice and growlers. At 11.30 p.m., as if it came out of the blackness of the Atlantic, the lookouts began noticing a haze in the distance, but didn't really think anything of it. Only nine minutes later, at 11.39, was the infamous call to the bridge from the crow's nest. As loudly as he could, Frederick Fleet rang off the lookout bell three times before calling down to the bridge. Is anyone there? He had reached the ear of 6th Officer James Moody. Yes, what do you see? Then came the three words forever synonymous with the Titanic. Iceberg. Right ahead. I can imagine the panic that must have broken out on the bridge when William Murdoch gave the order to slam the engines into full astern and attempt to navigate around the iceberg. As the ship attempted to make it around, some part of the iceberg below the waterline contacted the hull of the ship, a contact that lasted an eternity of seven seconds. The iceberg wasn't able to punch through the hull, but instead created a series of holes where the seams, held on by triple steel rivets, buckled and caused gaps in the hull, allowing the ingress of water. The punching along the hull took place along five of the ship's bulkheads, a distance of no less than 300 feet. The meeting that we see in Cameron's film, between Smith, Ismay, and Andrews, I like to believe is accurate. We know that both Andrews and Smith met, but it's unclear if Ismay was actually there. The key takeaway from this is that Thomas Andrews states a crucial piece of information in it. The Titanic was designed to stay afloat with four compartments compromised, but not five. It could continually operate if only two were lost to sea. It could even stay afloat if it lost three or four, but not five. There are many modifications that could have been made to Titanic which might have saved it, like the type of rivets used in the construction. For the sake of time, I'll let you look into that one a little bit further if you have further interest. The fourth officer, Joseph Boxall, later stated that the maneuver being attempted by Murdoch was known as a port around, which Murdoch did brief Captain Smith on, who had felt that the collision from his cabin and had reported to the bridge immediately. Murdoch's intent was to swing the bow of the ship around the iceberg, followed by the stern which would cause the entire ship to avoid the collision. Because the technology at the time is not what it is today, Murdoch lost 30 seconds of maneuvering time that the tiller took to engage. In the movie, when he gives the order, and then you see everyone below decks running around, yeah, that was about 30 seconds of time that they lost. While trying to slam the ship into full astern, unfortunately, the central turbine in Titanic couldn't be reversed, Thus, both the center and right props were stopped altogether. This leads to the theory that had the ship maintained its current speed with three active props, she may, and I mean may, have avoided the collision. Forward in the ship, lead fireman Frederick Barrett noted that the stoplight of the ship was engaged after the collision, not before, and other evidence points to Murdoch stopping the ship. It was at this point that Smith summoned Thomas Andrews, and the pair investigated the damage together. Andrews gave Smith the news that no captain wanted to hear. Titanic was going to sink in two hours' time. Any passengers present on the upper decks would have noticed the ice that dislodged from the upper parts of the iceberg after the ship struck it. Later, during the evacuation, 
Some even chose to play an impromptu game of soccer with it. Inside, it was noted by the stewards in first class that there was an incredible shudder. They only chalked this up to a propeller blade falling off. To be honest, most passengers inside the ship had no idea what happened, most simply ignoring it altogether. Those on the lowest of decks had a far different experience. One of those was engineer oiler Walter Hurst, who stated, We were awakened by a grinding crash along the starboard side. No one was very much alarmed, but we knew we had struck something. As the frigid water of the North Atlantic began to claim Titanic, it poured in at a believed rate of seven long tons per second. The ingress of water caused emergency systems to kick in, and the ship's pumps began trying to expel water from the ship. From the Cameron film, we heard Mr. Andrews say, The pumps buy you time, but minutes only. He was correct. Water was entering Titanic 15 times faster than it could be pumped out. Orders were given to the stokers and firemen to reduce the fires in the boilers in order to avoid potential explosions if ice-cold water met them. By the time their task was finished, those working away below decks were waist-deep in water. Another of the ship's emergency systems, the watertight doors, began being sealed whether manually by the crew or automatically once the floats were engaged. Each door took 30 seconds to close. Their warning bells rang out, and the crew were forced to find alternate exits if their doors were already shut tight. The easiest way to understand the way that the water entered the ship and continued back was like filling an ice cube tray. The water filled one compartment, spilling over the top of each bulkhead, back and back, cube by cube, until the entire ship would be filled. Because of her design, the flooding inside Titanic was inconsistent, having to work its way past closed doors and long passageways, quite a length of time considering the enormity of the ship. The rate of water incursion, however, doubled quite frequently. At five minutes after midnight, on the 15th of April, Captain Smith gave the order to uncover the lifeboats and muster the passengers. Most were already awake at this point, due not in part to the noise of the collision, but the stopping of the engines and the accompanying vibrations of the turbines. Smith issued orders to his radio operators to send out distress calls, unbeknownst to any coming to rescue them. But the position given was the wrong location by stating that it was on the west side of the ice field. Any potential rescuer would have been in the wrong area, about 25 kilometers away from Titanic. The stewards went door to door in first class to wake up any passengers still sleeping and told them to muster on the boat deck. The door to door approach had to be taken because Titanic had no internal public address system. The stewards in first class were largely responsible for waking all of their passengers, mainly to there being relatively few staterooms and berths. Below, the crew had a much more difficult time due to the passengers far outnumbering them. Those in first class were assisted in getting ready, donning life belts, and were guided to the correct areas they needed to be in. Those in second and third class had their rooms barged into, they were ordered to don life belts and report to the boat deck. This seems a bit brash, but there was only one priority now. Survival. Many passengers chose not to comply with the crew, much preferring the warm interior of the ship to the bitter cold night outside. This is of course true to form, for most humans in survival situations, not doing what they're told by those who actually know and want what's best for them. It's also important to note here that up to this point, none of the passengers were told that the ship was actually going to sink. While it was decently orderly up in first class, below decks was pure and absolute chaos with the amount of people they had. When the official order came down at 12.15 to don life belts, many passengers simply ignored it or believed the order to do so was a joke. It's funny how history often repeats itself many times over. 
As the crew worked to prepare the lifeboats, the process was interrupted by a horrible noise emanating from the funnels. The ship's steam was being released from its boilers and was incomprehensibly loud. One survivor attributed it to the sound of twenty steam trains letting go all of their steam at once. None of the passengers could hear one another, or the crew. It was so deafening that the crew members were forced to communicate by hand signals. Preparing the lifeboats was no easy task. The davits used to launch them were stored underneath some of the boats, each weighing multiple tons and having to be moved and erected by hand on the boat deck. Each lifeboat had a capacity of 68 people and should have been able to take around 1,200 with what they had, or at least half the accompaniment of the ship. I mentioned earlier that Titanic was supposed to have many extra lifeboats in addition to the 20 it embarked. The difference, mainly being because of aesthetics, was also cost-cutting, as it would have cost the builders a further 16,000 U.S. dollars. Now, before we go pointing fingers at White Star Line, let's address one point with the lifeboats that I alluded to earlier. In emergency situations like this, they weren't intended to be long-term solutions. The lifeboats were only meant to ferry passengers from the distressed ship to the rescue ship and return to get more. Near every ship in the British shipping lanes at the time followed this practice. White Star Line was no different. Also important to remember is that in the original designs for the ship, they wanted it to stand for two things, size and luxury. Encumbering the views of the passengers, especially those well-paying passengers, was bad for business, especially on such a special trip as their maiden voyage was. In the 40 years that he was a seagoing man, with 27 as captain, Captain Smith never experienced a crisis before. He would have been well aware, or at least made aware, that there weren't enough lifeboats to go around. It's here where the stories of him differ. Some survivors state that he became what we call operationally ineffective. He suffered a mental breakdown and became paralyzed by his own indecision, entering a sort of trance-like daze. Others paint a very different picture of him, stating that he took charge, as a captain should, and was nothing but calm cool, and collected throughout the entire process. I believe the latter is more believable, especially for someone with the amount of experience that Captain Smith had. Remember, he acted as soon as he heard the collision. He went into the lower decks personally to investigate with Andrews, not only once, but twice. He wasted no time after getting Andrews' diagnosis to start preparing the lifeboats and passengers to abandon ship. And Smith was even present, helping to load passengers into lifeboats in an event to mitigate panic. Having sailed myself, and been a Navy man for two years of my military career, there is nothing more tantamount at sea than the emergency preparedness of the crew. Time matters. Communication matters, and accuracy matters. Remember that the majority of the crew were casual, and not the static crew normally on the ship. Their training in emergencies and lifeboats was absolutely minimal. The crew conducted one lifeboat drill in Southampton, in which two boats with minimal crew were lowered, rowed to the dock, and came back. Unfortunately, in the lifeboats as well, They weren't fully provisioned. This was a no-fault due to the chief baker, Charles Jogan, who tried his best to keep them stocked. Captain Smith did originally have a lifeboat drill planned in the days preceding the sinking of the ship, but chose to cancel it for reasons lost to history. The crew actively worked at getting passengers loaded into the lifeboats, beginning around 20 minutes after midnight, or 40 minutes after the ship struck ice. The coordination for abandoning ship took place between Smith, Murdoch, and Lightoller, with Lightoller having to put his hands around Smith's ears, asking, I yelled at the top of my voice, Hadn't we better get the women and children into the boat, sir? He heard me, 
and nodded. Lightoller took charge of the port side, and Murdoch, the starboard. Here's where communication comes into play. Murdoch thought that the order meant to load the women and children first, while in contradiction, Lightoller thought it meant the women and children only. A crucial error. Partly empty lifeboats were lowered by Lightoller if there were no women and children present. Murdoch loaded men onto his boats if all the women and children in his vicinity had boarded. Then, we come to the tenet I mentioned of accuracy. Neither officer knew how many souls each boat could actually hold, so they erred on the side of caution and didn't fill them completely. If all the lifeboats that disembarked Titanic that night had been filled, they might have saved another 500 people. Now, we circle back around to the passengers, believing they knew more than the crew, or just being plain stubborn. When the lifeboats were being loaded, many flat-out refused to board them. As the extremely wealthy John Jacob Astor, who I'll talk about next week, stated, We are safer here than in that little boat. Well, not every well-to-do individual was as stubborn as Astor. Bruce Ismay, who Cameron's movie paints as a coward, having jumped into the lifeboat in front of William Murdoch, was actively moving about the boat deck and encouraging people to board the boats. He was effective in getting lifeboat number 7 loaded, which was the first to depart the ship at 12.45. Around 45 minutes later, Ismay did board one of the final boats to leave Titanic. Whether it was cowardice or not, I'll leave for you to decide. But do not discount how many lives Ismay might have saved by getting people loaded onto lifeboats before saving his own. Followed minutes later by lifeboat number six, which carried the unsinkable Molly Brown. Realizing that there was only one sailor on that lifeboat, Lightoller asked for a volunteer. His ask was met by Major Arthur Puchin of the Royal Canadian Yacht Club. Puchin had the honor of being the only man allowed on a lifeboat during the entire process by Lightoller. Here's a sad fact. Many of the able seamen I spoke of in the beginning were sent below to rouse passengers and herd them up to the boat deck. The majority of them became trapped by water in the lower decks and drowned. Lifeboats continued to be lowered every few minutes on the boat deck, while below, those either trapped or trying to escape the lower decks, watched their friends and fellow sailors meet an untimely end, being swept away in the currents of rushing water to their deaths. Some counts for the lifeboats were horrendous. Number five carried 41. Number three, 32. Number eight, 39. And worst of all, number one carried only twelve. It wasn't without its own struggles, as some lifeboats were almost submerged while trying to get away from the ship's side. Those actively seeking to turn a blind eye to all that was happening finally seemed to understand the gravity of the situation around twenty after one. Those present on the boat deck began saying goodbyes to one another and many husbands loaded their wives and children onto lifeboats. Amidst the firing of signal flares and distress calls that went out, the radio operators were still hard at work. Harold Bride told his colleague Jack Phillips to finally send out the SOS signal, as it might be the last chance to get it out. Many ships responded to their call, the closest of which is the now-famous RMS Carpathia which was a distance of 93 kilometers away. At that distance, Carpathia wouldn't reach Titanic for another four hours. Another that answered, the SS Mount Temple, did set a course for Titanic, but couldn't break through a large pack of ice formations. Fate is an interesting concept. The SS Californian, which warned Titanic about ice even shortly before it was hit, was in its vicinity. Only 19 kilometers away at the time Titanic struck the iceberg, the Californian's bridge officer saw a large vessel 
which made a hard turn to port, and then stopped. Their radio operator, Cyril Evans, had only recently gone to bed for the night. Had he remained at his post only 15 minutes longer, Californian would have received Titanic's distress call and might have been able to save hundreds, if not thousands, of lives. The officers on watch in the Californian also saw the rockets and flares being fired by Titanic. When the watch officer, 2nd Officer Herbert Stone, brought this to his captain, Stanley Lord, he chose not to take action, much to the dismay of Stone, who said, A ship is not going to fire rockets at sea for nothing. None of the people on Titanic believed this now was a joke. All knew the ship was sinking as the situation grew more dire. On a megaphone, Captain Smith continued issuing orders for women and children to enter the lifeboats. Passenger Eloise Hughes Smith pleaded with the captain to allow her husband Lucian to enter the boat with her. Her request was denied. Lucian told her, I never expected to ask you to obey, but this is one time you must. It's only a matter of form to have women and children first. The ship is thoroughly equipped, and everyone on her will be saved. Another passenger, Charlotte Collier's husband Harvey, told her, Go, Lottie, for God's sake be brave and go. I'll get a seat in another boat. It pains me to tell you that Lucian and Harvey, like so many others, never made it onto that lifeboat and both died that night. We're at the point now where I can clear up a few movie misconceptions from Cameron's film and confirm others. Isidore and Ida Strauss, the owners of Macy's department store, who Cameron depicts as laying in bed, awaiting their end, did choose to remain on the ship. As Isidore couldn't board a lifeboat, his wife told him, We have been living together for many years. Where you go... I go. They were last seen sitting down together on a pair of deck chairs, waiting on the end. Benjamin Guggenheim, the well-to-do industrialist, removed his life vest and sweater, opting instead for his top hat and evening wear, wanting, as he said in the film, to go down like a gentleman. Unfortunately, we'll never know if he got that glass of brandy. Another neat fact I wanted to take a moment and share with you from Cameron's film was with respect to the red-haired Irish woman and her two small children, the two children who she tucked into bed, knowing they'd never make it out alive. Giving them one last ounce of peace, she told them the story of the land of Tirnanog, an Irish folk tale that, as she mentioned, was a land of eternal youth and beauty. The interesting piece about this story is that to get to Tirnanog, children had to get there by going underwater. A testament to how great Cameron's Titanic film really was. Many of the passengers from the lower decks were finally starting to make their way to the boat deck. Many had become trapped below in the maze of corridors, or, as the movie does show, locked behind gates that separated the beauty from the beasts. Now let's clear this up. This was not because of evacuation by class. It was not segregation for segregation's sake. This served a purpose. It was mandated by the United States Immigration Service to keep steerage separate from those in the first and second class to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. Even when Titanic was set to arrive, the first and second class passengers were to be disembarked on the island of Manhattan and would be free to go, while the third class passengers were to be disembarked on Ellis Island and would be subject to health checks and processing. Now this wasn't to say that some of these gates weren't locked maliciously. There are reports from survivors that some gates were consciously locked and guarded by crew members in order to keep the steerage passengers below and from rushing the lifeboats. Corroborated by the story of Irish passenger Margaret Murphy shortly after her rescue, she said, 
Before all the steerage passengers had even a chance for their lives, the Titanic sailors fastened the doors and companionways leading up from the third-class section. A crowd of men was trying to get to a higher deck and were fighting the sailors, all striking and scuffling and swearing. Women and some children were there praying and crying. Then the sailors fastened down the hatchways leading to the third-class section. They said they wanted to keep the air down there so that the vessel could stay up longer. It meant all hope was gone for those still down there. I would be amiss here if I didn't mention a so-called hero of the lower decks, a certain John Edward Hart. Hart was a third-class steward who made three separate trips from the inner parts of the ship and led groups of people to the boat deck to evacuate. Many who followed him were English-speaking Irish immigrants. Some, like those third-class passengers noticed by firefighter Charles Hendrickson, made no attempt to leave. Many waited in the third-class passageways below for directions. Others could do nothing but pray, like those passengers noted by survivor August Vennerstrom. Hundreds were in a circle in the third-class dining saloon with a preacher in the middle, praying, crying, and asking God and Mary to help. They lay there and yelled, never lifting a hand to help themselves. They had lost their own willpower and expected God to do all the work for them. Needless to say, in line with Wennerstrom's thinking, do all the praying you want. Ask God or your deity to save you if you think that's what you need. But he's not going to sit your butt in the lifeboat. I don't mean to offend anyone who might be listening that's devoutly religious, but either way, in any emergency situation, God is always going to make it out alive and see another day. Whether he decides to drag you along with him is only ever up to you. By 1.30, the ship's downward angle was increasing. By 1.45, the engine room was completely flooded. The ship was nearing the water, and people began to panic. A group of men rushed lifeboat number 14, which, true to form, was lowered with only 40 souls aboard. It was defended by 5th Officer Lowe, who used his firearm to fire three shots in the air. Lifeboat number 16 was launched shortly thereafter, carrying stewardess Violet Jessup, who I'll tell you the story of next week and the one person on the Titanic who should bear the title, the unsinkable. Lifeboat 2 was lowered at 140, occupied only by men. When Lightoller found out, he evicted them all from the lifeboat, and instead of saving their lives, lowered the boat into the water with only 20 aboard. Minutes later, John Jacob Astor loaded his wife into boat number 4, but wasn't permitted aboard by Lightoller choosing instead to lower away with again only twenty aboard. The final boat to clear up the ship's side was collapsible boat D at five minutes after two carrying twenty-five people. By this point, the sea had swallowed Titanic up to the forecastle and it was rushing onto the boat deck. Captain Smith made his final rounds and told his crew, Now, it's every man for himself. His last orders were to the sailors trying to get collapsible boat A launched. Well, boys, do your best for the women and children, and look out for yourselves. Captain Smith took a final look around and returned to the wheelhouse in the bridge, where it's believed he chose to go down with Titanic into the crushing and black oblivion. Other reports exist, like that of survivor Harold Bride, who claims to have seen Smith jump overboard from the bridge in the ship's final descent. Another key player in the story, Thomas Andrews, was last seen in the first-class smoking room at five minutes after two, seemingly having resigned himself to his fate. Other reports have Andrews assisting with evacuations as late as 1.40. The mess steward, Cecil Fitzpatrick, 
stated he watched as Andrews threw deck chairs over the side for flotation devices and then jumped overboard with the captain. Either way you cut it, and whatever story you believe, neither Smith or Andrews were ever seen alive again. In her waning moments, there was a bit of humanity amongst the death and chaos. Second-class passenger and priest Thomas Biles took confessions from passengers, delivered absolution, and last rites. The two bands, now playing together as one under bandmaster Wallace Hartley, continued to play in the first-class lounge before moving to the boat deck near the first-class entrance. It should be noted from survivor stories that they were never outside as the movie portrays. Among the reports of their chosen songs were the Song de Tom by Archibald Joyce and the most synonymous song with her sinking, Nearer My God to Thee. Carpathia's bandmaster, George Orrell, later said, The ship's band, in any emergency, is expected to play bright music, dance music, comic songs, anything that would prevent the passengers from becoming panic-stricken. Various awe-stricken passengers began to think of the death that faced them, and asked the bandmaster to play hymns. The one which appealed to all was nearer my God to thee. With that being said, many survivors don't ever recall them playing that song, as it would have signaled imminent death, and only recall them ever playing cheery music. It was in the final moments of Titanic being afloat that many passengers from the third class finally made it above decks. Unfortunately for them, near all the lifeboats had already launched. At quarter past two, the intake of water became much more expedient. A giant wave crashed against the ship, sweeping away 6th Officer Harold Moody, Colonel Archibald Gracie, and Radio Operator Harold Bride. The latter two were able to right one of the collapsible boats, but Moody perished in that event. 2nd Officer Charles Lightoller abandoned his position, realizing further evacuation efforts were pointless, and dove into the sea. Though he was sucked into a ventilation shaft, he was blown clear by a rush of hot air and re-emerged next to a lifeboat. It was about this time that the forward funnel collapsed and crushed all in its wake, narrowly missing Lytoller and the lifeboat next to him by about fifty yards. As for the other key officers, William Murdoch, who was assisting people into the lifeboats, was last seen trying to launch collapsible boat A. It's unsure whatever happened to him, but he was confirmed dead, and his body was never recovered. Survivors also mention seeing an officer shoot himself just as the final moments of the Titanic were taking place. Cameron portrays this in the film as William Murdoch. However, the survivors do believe it was actually the chief officer, Henry Wilde. One of the ship's final moments is detailed by survivor Jack Thayer. Occasionally, there had been a muffled thud or a deadened explosion within the ship. Now, without warning, she just seemed to start forward, moving forward and into the water at an angle of about 15 degrees. This movement, with the water rushing up towards us, was accompanied by a rumbling roar, mixed with more muffled explosions. It was like standing under a steel railway bridge while an express train passes overhead, mingled with the noise of a pressed steel factory and wholesale breakage of China. The next moments were horrifying. The stern of the Titanic rose high into the air as the remainder tilted down into the water at an angle of 30 to 45 degrees. Next followed the unfathomable noise of a believed boilers exploding. A groan, rattle, and smash that lasted 15 to 20 seconds. After only a minute, the ship's lights flickered and were extinguished, leaving Titanic and all those still alive in darkness. In Thayer's words, there were groups of the 1,500 people still aboard, clinging in clusters or bunches like swarming bees, only to fall in masses, pairs, or singly as the great after part of the ship, 250 feet of it, 
rose into the sky. Due to the extreme force exerted on her midsection, Titanic's bow snapped the ship in half at the engine room. At some point, the bow detached and pulled the stern directly upright as the bow sank down into the darkness of the Atlantic. It was at this point that the stern began filling rapidly with water, causing it to appear to bob ever so briefly. The stern then sank slowly into the darkness, slipping beneath the waves at 2.20 a.m. on April 15, 1912, two hours and 40 minutes after its collision, and only a short while after Thomas Andrews's prediction. It's believed that the explosion of the boilers was actually the detachment of the bow from the stern section, as many of the boilers actually remained intact. Titanic sank towards her final resting place, with the bow and stern landing 600 meters apart. The sinking took only five to six minutes from the time it slipped beneath the waves to travel a distance of 3,795 meters at around 40 to 48 kilometers an hour before coming to rest on the ocean floor. I'll leave you for this week's chapter with the words of Jack Thayer as the Titanic disappeared from view. Gradually, her deck turned away from us as though to hide from our sight the awful spectacle. Then, with the deadened noise of the bursting of her last few giant bulkheads, she slid quietly away from us into the sea. This is where I leave you this week, my dear listeners, with the Titanic having just slipped below the waves of the North Atlantic, and her passengers and crew stranded, not knowing what's coming next. In part two next week, I'll tell you about the only lifeboat that went back looking for survivors, the rescue efforts made by the Carpathia, and the legacy of the Titanic. In addition... I also have six or seven character profiles ready for those who were aboard, both of those who lived and died across the three classes, the crew, the officers, and even the famous Jay Dawson himself. So make sure before you go that you subscribe to the podcast and give me a follow so you don't miss next week's episode and part two. If it's not too much trouble, I'd love you to leave me a review on the Spotify app by hitting the star button. It lets me know what you think of the episode and my work and helps others find the podcast, which helps me to keep creating content for you to listen to. As a reminder, new episodes of the Insidious Agenda podcast release every Tuesday at midnight Eastern Standard Time. But for now, it's time to close the cover of the Insidious Agenda. As always, I'm Nick, your host. And thank you very much for listening. I'll see you all again next week.